Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with disease, illness, an autoimmune disorder, or allergy, then do we have the Super Organism Show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Rodney Dietert, professor of immunotoxicology at Cornell University and author of Strategies for Protecting Your Child's Immune System and Immune Toxic... Boy, that's a tough word. Immunotoxicology, Immune Dysfunction, and Chronic Disease, and his latest book, which I can't put down, The Human Superorganism. And that's just what we'll be talking about today. What's our microbiome and how it's revolutionizing the pursuit of a healthy life. That plus we'll talk about giant pouched rats, Cliff the dog, the power of dark chocolate, why germ-free mice are antisocial, the importance of a giraffe's net, neck, and what a dog's obsession with doves has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Rodney. Are you ready to shine? I am, Michael. Well, a mighty woohoo! <laughs> awesome, and thank you for being on the show. We've already been talking about this off air. It's just too exciting of a topic. I wonder if you can share with us the dream that got you started down this path. Well, I had been given an invitation to write a paper to identify the single most important thing you could measure in a baby that would predict whether that child would have a life filled with health or a life filled with disease. And I was pretty sure I knew the answer from my 30 years of research. And I sat down to write the paper and couldn't get anywhere with it. Uh, it was terrible. I got a couple paragraphs, put it away in frustration, and went to bed that night um, and woke up in the middle of the night from a very powerful dream. I don't actually remember the details of the dream. I sort of woke up and said, wow, have I been dreaming? Wow, do I have this idea? And the idea was really what formed the rest of my career work and this book in part. And that was that the idea of a completed self, that the baby at birth in the absence of the microbes, of the microbiome, that's the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the parasites that live on and in us. In the absence of that, the baby's incomplete. And the extent to which the baby acquires the microbiome, a robust, diversified microbiome, in or around birth, really helps best define the likelihood of a healthy life versus one that is disease-filled. Certainly, we do other things after birth. We eat. We have various ex lifestyle experiences and the like that affect our health, no question. But this was the one measure. If you had to only measure one thing, this was the answer. And my wife helped translate my scattered thoughts from the middle of the night. We co-authored a paper, sent it off, didn't think anybody necessarily would see it, but it was seen by two UK filmmakers, made in, and the idea was incorporated into their documentary movie, Microbirth, that won the Life Science Film Festival Award for 2014. That led to more lectures, and one of those lectures was seen by a couple of book publishers and led to this book. And so that's really how you get from a dream, mm -hmm. uh, waking up in the middle of the night and trusting your middle of the night idea more than decades of your research necessarily. I had a, uh, a dream in 2004, was it 2004, that had me selling all of my racing gear. I was making a comeback. I'd been a professional cyclist for many years. I was training for the national championship. I'd gotten top 10 y year before at uh, Masters Nationals, and I woke up from my dream, sold all my racing gear. Six weeks later, I'm doing a 5,000-mile, 40-day solo bike ride across the country. <laughs> oh, man, fantastic. Dreams fantastic. are powerful things. They are, and also just you're selling that. You're, you're, you're opening up new space allows you to have these new wonderful opportunities show up and it, you know, just watch what you can pursue next. Absolutely. So you mentioned uh, something about a conference. I'm not sure exactly where you're going with that, but um, you were at a conference a few years ago, which I think was another pivotal turning point for you and certainly for your waistline. Right. Yeah, that was a conference in Germany. And uh, I should say that I'd struggled for more than 30 years with what finally got diagnosed as a gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD-induced recurrent sinusitis that had an allergy component as well. And it had really been uncontrolled so that I was getting three to four rounds of antibiotics every single year for, for over 30 years. And that's about 100 rounds of antibiotics, approximately. And finally... You've, you've got me beat. Yeah. I, and, I went through five years of straight antibiotic use all the way up the chain for chronic sinus uh, and sinusitis and two sinus infections. But 30, wow. 
Right. And, and of course, it was because I'd present, and that was what was needed by the time this got bad enough. But the, the, even the identification that it all started in the gut with this non-communicable disease, or what we call chronic disease, or GERD, um, still what to do about it was a question. Well, I, I happen to have co-organized a six-day conference in Frankfurt, Germany, and um, the fifth day of that conference, we'd been eating uh, local f sourced foods prepared by a chef, chef in the host institute. We'd been sitting around 12 days. We weren't exercising a lot. We were eating a lot and sitting. But after five days, my pants didn't fit. I dropped a waist size. And how does that happen? Well, it happened because it was all abdominal inflammation. And it was inflammation that I just carried, thought it was normal. It felt normal. I'd never felt really different for a long time. My doctor had been telling me, you, you need to lose weight. It would be very good to lose weight. And once I saw that, I realized there's something about U.S. food versus what I'm eating in Frankfurt that is causing a problem. It's causing inflammation. And I'm an immunologist, so I, you know, I, I kind of know the underpinnings of the process for that. I just didn't realize that was happening in my own body. So when I got back, I identified foods that I needed to eliminate. But you still get into those things. They're very difficult, particularly when I'm traveling, such as with the book tour for this book. And what I found was that probiotics are adjusting my microbiome and working mm -hmm. both ends of it, working the diet for a healthier diet, but also working on my microbiome was really the personal solution to both losing weight, but now going two and three quarter years with no antibiotics whatsoever. So I've been able to break that cycle from the gastroesophageal uh, disease to the need for antibiotics for the sinusitis. That is huge. I know for myself, I consider myself, I, I'm a uh, parakeet. Is it a parakeet? Uh, whatever kind of bird is in a coal mine. I guess it's it, not sure. Canary. It's, canary. Canary. Thank you. I'm going. That's the wrong bird. A canary in a coal mine. You just put the wrong quote unquote food next to my belly in a supermarket and it'll start to bloat. Right. And I'll know not to eat it. It sounds like you were in that family as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I identified several of those. And, of course, part of the problem is we now know, that, and one of the major topics in the book, is that the microbiome, the, the bacteria in our gut, for example, is a component. They affect our food cravings. They affect our mood, our behavior, our social, social interactions. And so I grew up in San Antonio, Texas in the 1950s and early 60s. And in addition to Mexican food, I eat a lot of fried chicken. Mm -hmm. The problem is now I'd love to eat things like kale. I know I should eat kale, but I cultivated, yes, there you go. Got my green <laughs> smoothie right here. There. Okay, you're ready with that. And, and so I know I should eat it, but I cultivated a garden or a gut full of microbes that use fried chicken as their energy source. Mm -hmm. And they can continue to call for that energy source and to manipulate or influence me. And they do that. So that's part of the problem, really. It got me thinking when, when I was reading, and we, we should back up to the beginning of the book here in a minute, but, but just what you're saying got me thinking of other conditions like alcoholism. Yes. And whether that could be, we can be the most... Uh, strong-willed, whatever we want to call it in the world, but where we've got six million or billion or maybe even trillion organisms screaming at us that you really want to drink. Right. So, I mean, with some of these things, there's certainly our own genetic components that are, are playing a role, uh, and it, it's a partnership with the microbes. But the microbes, we now know, for example, that in the gut, uh, a majority of our neurotransmitters and neurochemicals are actually made in the gut rather than the brain. And the microbes are able to make a lot of those, and they're able to control or regulate what our own human mammalian cells in the gut are making as well. So they, they both are the original producers of things like serotonin and dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, GABA, but they also control what our mammalian cells do as well. So they can really, they can exert a lot of effect on us and our uh, our choices, our behavior, um, and socialization. And there are colleagues of mine, for example, that can simply by changing one bacterial species or the, the species metabolites mm -hmm. in, in mice and in rats can make them very antisocial or not. So they can make them uh, such that they're playing with their cage mates, they're aware of the cage mates, and they, they are interacting and socializing with them, or they can make them OCD, where they obsess on a ball 
and are oblivious to the fact that there are other animals in the cage. And they can do th and flip that switch simply by one bacterial species or the metabolites of that. Wow. I'm thinking of uh, my wife and I used to make uh, kefir and kombucha, and uh, we made this coconut water kefir. Um, and when you would add uh, sugar or a sweetener to the kefir, and so it's got live probiotics in it, mm -hmm. you would add it, the thing would foam up, come to life, and almost come flying out of the jar, just <laughs> frothing. And I'm thinking what happens when they say you can't eat just one. If you put one bit of sugar, one chip in you, one piece of fried chicken, I guess, in your case, all of these probiotics inside of you, these organisms, come to life. Well, they're looking for their energy source. So you literally are selecting which ones will, will multiply, will increase in number, will metabolize, and then predominate your, the chemistry of your body, or which ones will fall by the wayside, maybe die out. And the, certainly the, the prebiotics, which are the food of the microbes in this case, and what you, what you put in is really important. So food is important. But you've got to have microbes that you can cultivate down in your, your gut and on your skin and in your airways. I should say we talk a lot about the gut, but the health of these on our skin, uh, in our respiratory tract, they're in our urogenital tract, they're even in breast tissue. They now know the breast uh, has its own particular microbiome. They're in the placenta uh, and, and active during pregnancy. So uh, being able to keep these in a healthy balance is really useful and really important. So let's, let's back up then and let's talk about what a superorganism is and what are we really talking about when it comes to the to microbiome? Because this is a complete flip from a you are your genes, you are a, a, trying to be a sterile robot going through life to something completely different. Right. So part of the, it's sort of like our success was our problem and that is in the, in the, 20th century, early 20th century, we were ravaged with bacterial diseases, infectious diseases, but cholera, typhoid, and, and a lot of different things. And antibiotics were the uh, they were a miracle drug, and uh, incredibly important. And became, you know, through to the mid 20th century, they got commercialized. You could make large quantities of them, and they really saved us from a lot of. Uh, killer diseases, global killer diseases. So we kind of got this idea that, well, if, if killing bacteria help us, then killing more has got to be great for us. And that was the wrong idea in retrospect. Well-intentioned, but, but in retrospect, the wrong idea. Uh, because it turns out we've got to have them. We grew up with them. Our ancestors grew up with them. Our bodies are honed for having those over millennia. And um, so you start to wipe them out or you start to degrade the diversity of the human microbiome, and we get sick. And that's exactly what we've seen. We've seen the challenge of infectious diseases in the last century get replaced with what we call chronic or non-communicable diseases. So that's asthma, autism spectrum, dis and I should say diseases and conditions. So mm -hmm. asthma, autism spectrum disorder, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, obesity, psoriasis, diabetes, heart disease, all the cancers, um, and these have really, these are all increasing in prevalence and have since about 1970, um, all in unison, all of them going up to where they're now, based on the latest CDC estimates from February, they're now killing three quarters of the world. So all global deaths, three quarters of global deaths are due to these conditions, not infectious diseases, not Ebola or Zika or the rest. So in other words, to go back, and, and I wouldn't mind diving into the Amazon for a minute or tropical forest, right. as we're killing off the ecology and diversity of the planet, we're killing off the ecology and diversity living on our skins, such as with hand sanitizers, and the list goes on and on, antibiotics all the way down, and when that diversity doesn't exist, neither do we. That's right. Yeah, and, and basically the book, I think, identifies six pillars, the really important pillars that have that are deserve attention if we're going to reverse this epidemic of non-communicable diseases and that are really kind of what have led to where we are now. And again, these, these were all through very good intentions. It's just we didn't understand human biology like we do now. So it's useful to think of us different in terms of what kind of organism we are and what's going to be good for us in terms of the food we eat, the places we live, and, and how we go about our day-to-day -day choices. And so that's what the 
book is about is how to actually live a healthier life, how to how to blunt these diseases in terms of the epidemic at the core in terms of what is leading to the problem and how we can do that individually, but also how we can do it in terms of healthcare, how we can change our approach to therapeutics. So maybe we should go into, maybe start with the, the pillars of NCDs and then we go into the causes of the epidemic. You say that NCDs get programmed early in life, before birth to age four. What does that look like? Right. So there is this, uh, the, the title of this concept is Developmental Origins of Adult Health and Disease. And that was actually started by a, a physician named Robert Barker in the UK. And he was looking at prenatal development nutrition in particular, and heart disease. Mm -hmm. And he was able to show uh, stark programming links between uh, maternal nutrition and the prenatal environment and heart disease. And that that got, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, I'm not moving around, so I will. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I get what you're saying. <laughs> well, there we go. Yes, you see. Another benefit of standing desk. That's right. They do not let us be inactive here at Cornell. We keep on the go. And uh, so... Um, heart disease was the first one of these identified, but then it turns out you can look at uh, risk of obesity or risk of asthma, and you can take any of these NCDs and find that there are, that the windows of vulnerability, the greatest vulnerability, mm -hmm. is early in life. And so that can be prenatal uh, and early postnatal development as well. And so that's where you get maximum benefit by paying attention to nutrition and environment and drugs that and makes, potential adverse effects. That makes sense. We'll jump more into those in a minute. The second one, uncontrolled inflammation, which maintains the disease state. And I'm guessing this is why this leads into the next one. One NCD tends to lead to the next and to the right. next as well. Right. I think I said NCDs beget other NCDs, basically. And that is really the pattern that you see. In fact, when you reach my age, uh, if you've got one, you're more likely to have three. Uh, and you're, you're going to have different, each one of those has medications that are prescribed for those, and then you start to get into um, counterindications where you're not supposed to take these together, and that's really what is ahead for the aging population in higher and higher prevalences. So the problem is, let's take childhood asthma. Mm -hmm. um, there are eight to 10 or more additional non-communicable diseases that are likely among the cohort of children diagnosed with asthma. And pediatricians usually treat the presenting symptoms of asthma. Child comes in, child has asthma, uh, the, the pediatrician treats that asthma. But the pedi pediatrician hasn't been aware that risk of overweight, that behavioral disorders, that lung cancer, and a number of other conditions are more likely among that group of children. And we've done nothing to prevent those. We didn't really know about them, so mm -hmm. it's not, again, not, not intentional. It's just we didn't know about them. Well, every one of these NCDs has pretty much double-digit additional conditions that are more likely because they have common underpinnings. And one of those is, is um, misregulated or uncontrolled inflammation. So one of the things in the book is it's more valuable to prevent childhood asthma, childhood obesity, type 1 diabetes. Don't get started with these conditions because of the comorbid risk. But in addition, if you have one of those, if you're diagnosed with one, intervention and doing something different is useful because we know what happens if we do what we've been doing. And that is, you know, three quarters of the world dies with these things and lead decades of life requiring additional ever accumulating medications and increasing disability among populations. And I was fascinated by medications. Basically, you were saying if it if it affects your stomach, sort of like NSAIDs, even basic yes. things we thought were, were innocent, which are far from it, like aspirin, can actually be damaging our microbiome. Right. So, the, the again, this is unintentional consequences. Uh, drugs have been screened for safety. They're regulated, screened for safety. But keep in mind, and I, again, I'm tox a toxicologist and part of my title as well. So... Safety was screened for the mammalian human, that part of us. It was never screened for microbial safety. And so that's the problem, is we basically, as in terms of safety of drugs, safety of environmental chemicals, need to retest, need to redo the landscape, because these things were only screened to protect mammalian human cells. Now, the problem is, too, 
where are the microbes located? They're located on the skin, the outer part of the gut, the, the part connected to the environment. They're, uh, again, the urogenital tract in the airways. Mm -hmm. Those are the routes we get exposed. So inhalation, you breathe in air with, let's say, um, particulate matter. Again, uh, urban particles, air pollution, ozone. Uh, the microbes see it first. You take an oral drug, the microbes see it first. Uh, you eat uh, lead contaminated, or you drink arsenic contaminated water, the microbes see it first. Um, dermal exposures, again. You have a, a shirt. I, yeah. The latest shirts have UVA protection in uh, nano uh, protection in the shirt, which can go right through the skin. Right, right. So the, the problem is the microbes are actually, we, we in fact exist in the environment with a microbial filter. They're sitting between us and what's outside of us. And they, they're a gatekeeper. So they are seeing everything um, short of maybe an injection into your body. They're seeing everything before the mammalian cells see it. And how they handle food, environmental chemicals, and drugs determines what our gut cells see, what our other, you know, our lung cells see. Uh, so they only see what, what is presented after the microbes have dealt with it. I want to want to dive for a minute into how we help ourselves and and help our full microbiome. But I want to get I want to step back and really get a full picture. W what are the numbers that we're looking at? And are we talking in the cell, in between the cell, gene swapping? How deep down the rabbit hole does this go? And how much of me is me versus um, a an entire universe or a party of other organisms going on here? Right. Well, by weight, you're mainly a mammalian human. But by cell number, you're, depending on the estimates, either a slight majority, microbial, or a larger majority. And I should say, after the book went to press, a, a paper came out saying, well, it may only be 57% microbial, whereas earlier estimates had been 90. So it's between 57 and 90% of the cells in our bodies are microbes, are microbial. Uh, the rest, human mammalian. By genes, it's a bigger uh, disparity. Uh, and that is that we have about 22 to 25,000 human mammalian genes on our chromosomes. Across the human population, they're, they're estimated to be just under 10 million microbial genes. So 99% of our genes are microbial. And these are making enzymes, they're making cell surface proteins, they're signaling, uh, they're metabolizing. So they are doing things in our body. And that's why they can exert an uh, influence that we never even dreamed of until recently. So this is just this kind of jumps ahead and maybe off track, but maybe not so much. When we talk about things like uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and putting them in us where we may or may not know if they're quote unquote safe, although it seems that safety is innocent till proven guilty, at <laughs> least in the US, but, and, and feel free to dive in there, but we have done no testing, like you're saying, on the microbes. Right. In general, that, that is true. And so I do know that internally some pharmaceutical companies have surveyed existing drugs, and uh, there's no uh, paper in the literature I can point to. I've only had, I've had speakers come after me at talks that have presented uh, the data. And uh, basically, not surprisingly, a majority of existing drugs in some of these surveys are um, produce adverse effects on the microbiome. And that's not shocking at all. I would think it would be uh, almost 99% because they were never screened to be safe. So uh, it's not shocking that they do affect the microbiome. And obviously, the duration and the dose can, uh, can in some cases present damages that lead to, you know, so you may benefit one uh, in terms of one disease and one group of symptoms only to have another disease show up later because the microbiome was unintentionally damaged during the therapy. Well, you talk about the, the immune system being a um, junkyard dog. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, when I started teaching here at Cornell uh, 39 years ago, teaching immunology, uh, we were basically taught, and I was teaching something that's, that's really not viewed as correct now. That is, you're good to go at birth. You have all the immune cells you need, and you're just great to function, and uh, you don't need to worry about too much else. And now we know that's, that's such an oversimplification as to be wrong. You've got the cells in place, but a lot of those are going to expand, and the ratios are going to change, and they actually have to interact with the microbe. 
microbiomes. So if what, one of the things that happens is if the microbiome is not in place, if it's deficient, uh, if it's too restricted, it doesn't have the diversity, the numbers of species that are needed, then the immune system never learns what's safe and what's not safe. And you have this immune system all ready to go, but what it's going to go against is something like peanuts, peanut allergens, or pollen, or maybe your thyroid. It'll attack. Eventually, it's going to attack internal organs or it's going to attack something innocuous in the environment if it is not actually cultivated along with your microbes in a co-maturation, a co-development. So then how, this is, this is beyond critical because people are left and right. We know somebody, we have something. It's a generation that's, that's a mess and getting worse. What do we do for women getting pregnant, thinking of getting pregnant, or when a baby is first born? Right. So I've encouraged OBGYNs at, at continuing medical education credit conferences that they actually have a, this incredible, wonderful new mission, or actually anyone, a doulas, other people that are helping pregnant women during the pregnancy, because we do have increased prevalence now, uh, including of pregnant women, carrying these non-communicable diseases. So they, in many cases, have a restricted diversity of their microbiome. And that's an opportunity to do something for their benefit by helping them to rebiose or do a microbial makeover, expand their microbiome uh, using probiotics, prebiotics, and other strategies that will benefit their health, but also that's preparing the microbial donation that mom will give to the baby. And so you really are setting up what that mother will donate to the baby at birth that's going to start that baby on that trajectory of life in terms of health or disease. So that's a, a critical window, obviously. It's two-generational health benefit to do something during pregnancy. But you can do something at any age. And it doesn't have to be in a pregnant woman. You can take me in my 60s mm -hmm. and still have benefit by paying attention to your, your microbiome. This is interesting. You got me if, to jump back. I want to jump into you in a minute, but back to somebody who's pregnant. Pregnancy cravings tend to go hand in hand. If we're doing a rebiosis, kind of a repopulation, a rebalancing of everything going on inside of us, and we've got things screaming at us and we're pregnant so that we're thinking, I don't want to rock the boat right now. How in the world do you do this? It sounds like professional help may also be in it. <laughs> well, you actually have some some mood swings and things like that that may be smoothed out by, I mean, now they're suggesting through this new field of psychobiotics that instead of taking heavy-duty drugs for depression, you're probably going to take a probiotic or take mm -hmm. the metabolites uh, because that's turning out to be extremely effective in, in again, controlling uh, behavior and mood. So uh, you actually could probably smooth out some of the issues that are frustrations uh, to pregnant women as well. Um, so yeah, managing it, it uh, you know, intelligently is going to be useful. But there, there is the likelihood that you can actually um, balance out things maybe more effectively. In fact, endocrinologists have basically, everybody's claimed the microbiome. So the, the neuro people say it's your second brain or the gut is, the microbiome obviously the key player down there. Uh, the endocrinologists, the hormone people say that, wow, that's the missing endocrine organ. So again, it, uh, even in hormone ratios and balances, you, you may have an opportunity to, uh, to take what is a fairly benign approach. Uh, a biologically, you know, you're, you're really dealing with part of the per what is already in the person. You're simply shifting part of their biology. Beautiful, beautiful. So from there, one more thing on pregnancy, then we're going to move on to, to general population. What can you tell us about the history of the C-section and what it means for the baby? First of all, C-sections are often medically necessary, and clearly they should be done when they're medically necessary. So no one is talking about a medically needed c cesarean section. But What's been seen is elective cesarean has been increasing in prevalence and uh, in, in virtually every country, but in some countries to uh, majority levels, at least in s some parts of Brazil, for example, have very high levels. Uh, U.S., U.K. Uh, have had increases in this. And what cesarean does that we now know is, is a problem for the baby is it disrupts or interrupts the seeding of mom's microbiome. 
So the gut microbiome in particular is seeded during vaginal delivery or natural mm -hmm. childbirth. And when the baby comes down the birth canal, the baby is coated in and literally swallows uh, both uh, vaginal and cecal contents, uh, uh, microbial contents from the mom. And this is what are the, the first arrivers, the seeding populations of microbes that then start to mature in the baby, hopefully supported by breast milk when, whenever possible, breastfeeding. So that is the ideal. That's the baby seeded with, again, this massive number of genes from the, the mom that are not chromosomal genes but are microbial genes. Uh, but cesarean interrupts that. So eventually, so that baby comes down with a gut that's pretty much devoid of microbes, mm -hmm. but the, the gut locations will acquire microbes. So what are they going to acquire? They're going to get them from the hospital environment. They'll get them from attendants or surfaces at the hospital. And those are not necessarily the bacteria that you want in that baby's gut. Uh, and so what happens is cesarean delivered babies have a reduced diversity of the microbiome. It doesn't look like the mom. And that is known now to affect uh, physiological development. Uh, in particular, it affects the immune system. 60 to 70% of your immune cells are in the gut. So it's not shocking that the gut microbiome composition uh, affects a lot of your uh, immune performance capabilities. So with this restricted diversity, you, you get into this problem with uncontrolled inflammation, and uh, this has been associated, again, I have to stand up. No, no worries. <laughs> associated, just... thank you. I get my exercise during this. So that's associated with the elevated risk then of um, childhood asthma, type 1 diabetes, and obesity. And I should say, while I remember it, there is a figure in the book I, I love people to see. Uh, I show it when I get to show slides at, at book talks uh, called The Obesity Tree. And it basically shows 32 of these comorbid, non-communicable diseases that are associated with obesity. So it's another reason to not just look at obesity as something to manage better and lose weight as you can, but to actually intervene in a way that's going to stop this uncontrolled inflammation. Because otherwise, what you've got ahead is 12 different cancers and a lot of other non-communicable diseases that are at a, a higher risk for that group. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with rebiosis, so so I want to go in there next and and talk about that. With that said, in that section of the book, I went through. You had a list of NCDs, and my former list former is the key word was asthma, chronic sinus infections, irritable bowel syndrome, sleep disorders, tension deficit, hypoglycemia, prediabetes, bone density challenges, and uh, dairy allergies. Wow! Wow! Absolutely. Absolutely. The TV and, dinner world. Yes. No. Yes. Uh, food. Food. I had the chapter in there on food technology and how wonderfully we could eat pretty much anything from anywhere, anytime, but didn't mean we were ne necessarily, we were eating more processed foods and, and there's some problems with that. So, well, congratulations to you that you've been able to get on top of that impressive list. I've got my probiotics here. There you here. go. I've got my, my uh, raw kale smoothies. Yes. I go after this with everything we had. We produced kombucha and kefir for a while and sauerkraut and fermented everything. And, and we still have a long way to go. So maybe you can coach us here. Coach us all. We're going down this hole. Maybe, maybe we even took a cycle of antibiotics for one reason or the other. And what do we do to start healing our microbiome? Well, one of the things that we found useful, my wife and I uh, uh, get our microbiome screened. Uh, so getting a profile to know where you are and what you might be missing or have a, a deficiency in uh, can be helpful uh, because then you have a target to know what you might like to add or what, uh, in different locations. And so there are a variety of companies out there that will do that. The quality of the information they're providing is increasing mm -hmm. uh, literally every month. Uh, because their databases are larger and there's a, a better biological understanding of, among the microbial species as well. Um, and in addition, the, the variety of probiotics out there um, and the research on them is increasing, although to some extent it's a little bit the wild, wild west. Uh, the bottom line is, does it work in your body? If it doesn't, then it's a waste of money for you in the end. So it has to be not just good on paper, but good inside you or on your skin. Um, but basically knowing where you are and then being able to 
to add to that um, so that you're not just taking every probiotic in sight, that's not the goal, um, is, is useful. Uh, re, you mentioned fermented foods, and there's a section on those in the book, because one of the things of the food technology is we unintentionally lost our connection. As, a, as society, every culture had fermented foods, and we've kind of let that go uh, because we've had, hadn't had to use that as a food storage method. And in doing that, we lost some pro probiotics and prebiotics that our ancestors were, were getting and were benefiting from. So returning to that is useful. Uh, probiotics and, and feeding them with prebiotics is useful, but knowing which ones uh, and knowing that you're getting pre probiotics that are of a particular mix of, of species and also strains, pay attention to strain, because different strains of bacteria carry different genes. And some of those matter. They'll, they'll, they'll make enzymes. They're going to affect your metabolism. So it's not all lactobacillus acidophilus are equal. Some of them carry uh, some sets of genes, others other sets overlapping, but other sets of genes. And you want to find the ones that will actually change your metabolism in a useful way. That makes sense. What are uh, prebiotics, and where do we look for those? So prebiotics are the food of the microbes, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in, uh, there are uh, fibers in many cases, or uh, fiber-rich foods. There are co uh, complex sugars, different kinds of sugars. So the, the premier source of prebiotics is breast milk. And it turns out that breast milk um, nutritionist dietitians knew for decades that breast milk contained a large portion of it contained the sugar compounds that our mammalian human cells can't digest. And they used to ask the question, why are they there? We can't use them. What are they there for? And that's actually my answer. If anybody says, well, is this microbiome thing a fad? I say only if you think breast milk is a fad because it's been honed over millennia to contain uh, this massive amount of food that is only there for the microbes. It's not there for the human mammalian part of us. It's there for the microbes. So that's the original early life prebiotic that's so important for feeding our microbes and helping them to co-mature with our brain, our gut, our immune system. Uh, but there are other, again, uh, uh, sugars as well, uh, complex sugars uh, that are very good in terms of feeding particular species of bacteria so that you literally uh, can be the master gardener. You can help to grow and give advantage to uh, particular species in your microbiome that you want to be enriched. Can you buy prebiotics off of the shelf? Where do you go to get them? Yes. No, you can. Well, you can buy them at drugstores. You can buy them at, at uh, natural food stores and vitamin stores, and it's a matter of knowing what to look for. Uh, some of them are also put in with the probiotics. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you'll have probiotics that already have some prebiotics in there, biotics in there, but you may want to continue to have some consumption of prebiotics uh, after you install the microbes because you'll want to cultivate them, not just uh, give them one shot at growth. This, uh, this kind of tangent slightly here, and I wanna, I wanna dive into will, uh, will you do no harm for a moment here, but I'm thinking now of artificial sweeteners because we now know that the artificial sweeteners may not give you quote unquote calories, but they certainly may be feeding your microbiome and parts of the microbiome that you'd rather keep asleep. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, every, everything is now open to a reassessment. Uh, and that's great for toxicologists. I, I tell them it's good news, bad news. Uh, we didn't exactly do it right in hindsight because we should have ideally screen safety for the microbiome, but now we get to do it all over, so we got work for decades to go. Um, and that's, that's true. You are consuming things, again, that were deemed innocuous for the human mammalian cells, but they're probably not innocuous for the microbiome. And some of them may be beneficial in certain ways. Some of them are, are definitely detrimental. And uh, again, that's, that's the case with a lot of a lot of environmental chemicals and a lot of drugs. Uh, well, there are, there are examples in the book about drugs that literally can could save your life, mm -hmm. are worthless, not going to work in you, or could kill you, all depending upon one species of bacteria and how much of it you have in your gut. So that right that right there tells you the importance of having a microbiome profile, and particularly your doctor having one, because your doctor otherwise, uh, in many cases, is flying blind on therapeutic dose.
that makes sense. Can you tell us of a few things we, we talked about at the beginning briefly, particularly here in the U.S., it seems to be innocent till proven guilty. What are a few things that are on your radar or on world radar now that we're realizing may not be so safe? Well, the, the, the big one that has been an issue in the U.S., and I've, I've in fact, I've had some interesting question and answers at, at international conferences about it is bisphenol A, which is the plasticizer that's been in baby products and and even baby BPA. nipples, BPA. And as you know, Europe took the precautionary principle approach that if you're going to expose massive numbers of people, particularly in this case infants, and uh, you're, you're going to have a lot of it in your environment and in the foods and in the system, you better know it's safe. And you really want to know it's safe ahead of time. And uh, you know, that's, that's extremely important. You don't want to expose most of the world's population for a couple of generations and then find out something really damaged their health. Uh, and that's the alternative approach is Intel proven dangerous, we'll go ahead with it. And some countries have taken the Intel proven dangerous and others have taken the, no, you're not going to expose everyone until we know it's safe or precautionary principle. And with BPA... Uh, Europe was much faster to ban it, to get it out of products. The FDA has been incremental in its removal of it or recommendations and much delayed compared to Europe, for example, or that's been the U.S. approach. Uh, triclosan was just recently actually taken out of um, antibacterial soaps, mm -hmm. which may be good for re uh, several reasons. You actually don't want to overuse antimicrobial or antibacterial soaps. And that's not to say you don't want to sterilize. There are times when you do, but you don't want to have your body always sanitized. But the other thing is triclosan is a major endocrine disruptor. I mean, it is a real problem and particularly it's a real problem in early life. And again, that was uh, dealt with by some countries using precautionary principles and it took a lot longer uh, in others. So, and going back to uh, BPA, well, I guess I should mention, I'm thinking of, of my sister. I love her very much. She's struggling with lupus, and so she uses a hand sanitizer whenever she goes out, and it really seems like a chicken and an egg scenario. How does somebody even get out of that scenario? Well, you, you start to look at how your, all your chemicals, your household chemicals, and how, you know, when and where and how you're sanitizing, and, and realize that there are times, you know, if you are going to visit, uh, if you're handling raw milk or visiting a pig farm or something like that, and you haven't been there, or you're going to uh, another country uh, uh, that you're not used to the microbes there, uh, you may want to sanitize. But on the other hand, in a lot of day-to-day -day things, we over-sanitize. And that shows you there, there are um, microbiologists that map the microbes on the skin and they can tell you what products you've been using and where you've been using them on your body because of of them basically killing microbes in those locations so it's it's important to realize that that in a lot of the products we are overdoing it and and again it's a matter of understanding where you're likely to encounter a dangerous pathogen uh, versus simply using a product because uh uh, it's been on the store shelves, and a lot of them now are antimicrobial, and we still have this mindset, antimicrobial is good. It'll keep me from getting sick. But in fact, it contributes or can contribute to this depletion of the microbiome and are getting sick in a different way. To use your word can that you just said for a minute, earlier you were talking about BPAs, and when you think of BPAs, you typically think of plastic. But I was surprised a few years ago to realize that cans can have just as much BPA as the plastic as well. And there's very few, there's now a trend, but there are still very few cans that actually say things like BPA-free on them. Right. No, we've only gotten it out of some products and not others. And uh, it's very pervasive and it's a real problem. And it damages several different physiological systems and participates in this developmental programming disruption uh, because of its endocrine disrupting uh, capacity. And uh, so, you know, that, that is an issue. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's really a concern that just got identified is in processed foods, there are these things called food emulsifiers. Thank you. And food emulsifiers help to make, make things like ice cream smooth. They, they keep things from separating out, so they'll keep oils from separating out and keep, keep food homogenized, uh, processed food homogenized. And a couple of them are named polysorbate 80 and carboxymethylcellulose, very prevalent in our foods. These are now known to damage 
a couple different microbial species that regulate the mucin layer, which is the barrier fence between our gut mammalian cells and our microbes. And it's sort of like good fences, good neighbors. We actually want to keep some of those microbes at a slight distance uh, from our mammalian cells. And this is what the mucin layer does that kind of coats our gut lining. So when these are damaged by food emulsifiers and other environmental factors, it thins that layer and it brings the bacteria too close. And that initiates both, uh, it can compromise the gut lining, produce leaky, leaky gut, but it also will stimulate this uncontrolled inflammation. And that has really been seen in, in lab animals, in the rodent models we use, as the start of metabolic syndrome or obesity. Mm -hmm. So it's not the only way to become obese, but it's a way that seems pretty efficient, pretty effective. And it all comes down to a couple of bacterial species that are the gatekeepers for the mucin layer. So what would you say if you were put on the spot and asked for what are uh, Rodney's rules for food shopping? How do you do it? Well, uh, uh, I eliminate the things that I know are going to cause a problem for me that are, that, uh, are going to give me a gut sign real fast, and I know the early sign of it. So uh, in that case, that's uh, 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 lactose and some dairy products. Mm -hmm. It's gluten, so I've gone very low gluten. Uh, it's some grains also. Uh, give me a problem also, and so I have to be very careful there. And um, that's and some nuts, not all nuts, and some of them have threshold levels. So I can have a couple, but I know my limit. And uh, and again, I know what probiotics. I've got three or four that are my go-tos. That if I get into a food, um, sometimes you're not aware you're getting into something. That I can immediately control it. Never goes beyond the, the first 24 hours or so of a gut sign. How much do you look at um, organic or not worry about it? And what about uh, pesticides, insecticides? No, it, it, it is important. I mean, again, we're, we're now reali realizing some of these environmental chemicals that you thought the level was okay, the dose was okay, or that it was just safe for mammalian cells. You don't know it's safe. Again, <laughs> <laughs> it's not too much I can do about that. Sorry. No the, worries. The, um, that you, you don't know they're safe for the microbes. And so... Um, whole foods, getting away from processed foods uh, is really important when you can. Again, incorporating, if, if your body takes it well, incorporating some fermented foods. Uh, and, and so that, you know, those, we've had those kind of recommendations out there, uh, but I think that there's another reason to do it now. And also, in, again, getting some of these complex carbohydrates that can help feed the microbes. So uh, inulin, there are a lot of different components that are known to be important for our gut bacteria and uh, including those either as a supplement or just in the in the food you're eating you may be getting uh, enough in the in the diet that you're eating now is so really important so you're a bean fan yeah in, in its place again yep yep very definitely so uh, let's go from there let's talk real briefly and at the end I'd love to do a, a, a short guided meditation how can meditation and and calming the body or calming the mind help calm our microbiome? Well, we always talk about gut instincts. And I told you that this idea of this book came about waking up middle of the night. And uh, I've used a variety of contemplative tools, which includes meditation and, and uh, listening and something called deep play and, and a whole variety of tools to get out of the, actually get out of my regimented, focus harder scientific mindset, mm -hmm. which has its place. But if it's not working in terms of insights and solving problems, then you need to do something different. And using meditation not just as, as a body calming strategy, but also as a way to observe my issues, observe problems or what I'm looking at uh, or focusing on differently has been extremely useful for me. And I'm now teaching a course in this at Cornell and also teaching that for added resiliency for incoming Cornell students at one of, at one of our orientation sessions. Beautiful, beautiful. We'll do a, a brief meditation at the end. I'm curious, what is deep play? Deep play is when you are able to get into a play state. Uh, 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 I call it the play of the five-year-old. That's my mm -hmm. goal is to be a five-year-old at Disneyland, where all of the rule sets, all the fences, all the boundaries, all the conventional wisdoms that you operate in, your, your box mm -hmm. is really not there that those things you were taught you can't do or shouldn't happen or wouldn't happen in the circumstance is, is, is wide open. It's, 
it's not so regimented. And you have wiggle room. You have more wiggle room. And you have the awe of the five-year-old who's really approaching things for the first time. The beginner's mind. A lot of people talk about that. And so deep play, we actually have an exercise in the course where we use Lincoln Logs and Legos and Play-Doh, and people actually uh, construct models of their problem. And then from a meditative state, mm -hmm. they construct a solution set. My wife actually came up with this, this particular exercise, but it's called a remodeling exercise. And it's, people get results because you're using your hands, you're using your body intuition, and you're actually working, you're working in 3D spaces. And you're working from a meditative state. So you're actually taking the problem, tearing it apart, and then looking differently at it with this meditative state. Very, very cool. Well, from there, uh, a few quick wrap-up questions that we'll jump into a meditation. Jessica, oh, my wife, she always wants me to ask, what advice would you give today to parents to help their kids with their own microbiome? Well, I think um, assuming that they're on a property that doesn't have high contamination of heavy metals outside in the soil, lead contamination, for example, assuming they're there, let them play outside. Uh, I mean, the book cover has the, the handprint, uh, and that was from Tasha Sturm, and her eight-year-old son had played outside and came in, and he actually, I think, wanted to, she, she was a microbiology teacher, he wanted to plate it on one of her Petri dishes, and she was more than willing, and then uh, let the, the microbes grow up and took a photograph of it. It's an iconic photograph. It's been exhibited in the American Museum of Natural History, and we're fortunate to have it on the book cover. But it just shows you that that's, that's the natural state. We feel better when we're out in the environment. We're connecting. There's a part of us, keep in mind, we've got microbes in our gut that are in the geysers at Yellowstone, that are underneath Antarctic glaciers, the bottom of the Marianas Trench, growing on the International Space Station, in the Dead Sea, and the same species are in our gut. And so we, we can feel pretty close when we're in the environment because we have microbial kin in those places. So being out there, letting your kids play, letting them experience the environment, and keeping them safe from dangerous pathogens, but, but let them interact. If, if you're going to have a furry pet, have it early in the household. If, you're, if you don't have a hyperallergic family, dogs are great for sharing microbes. They'll pass everything around, and that's wonderful because you'll just keep the diverse microbiome going. So I think, you know, let them enjoy those things. Don't over-sanitize, and in the end, you're probably going to have a healthier, uh, let that child have a greater chance at a healthier life. Woohoo! <laughs> so a uh, question we'd like to ask just before the end, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Oh, well, I have a hobby. Yeah. And I guess I'll have to tell you about my hobby because that I'm in a, a, a wonderful place there. Uh, it's swing dancing. And I took it up middle age. It's a great way to socialize, and it's mm -hmm. a great way to get exercise. So I'd rather be dancing than walking more on the treadmill, for example. And you interact with the music. If you have a live band, you have a partner. You're moving your body with the music. Uh, you're, co you're doing a coordination with all of those above. It's great Alzheimer's preventative. And there's nothing like there's a space I can get into with my body that is a different kind of meditative state. So I, I love uh, deep meditation is also mm -hmm. a joyful state, but this is a, a, this gives me an energy, a different type of energy that I pretty much only experience doing swing dancing. So it is a, 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 a rejuvenating meditative place for me. I love it. And I took swing lessons many years ago. I can't say I got very good at it, but it'd probably be my favorite of all types of dance. It's really fun. Fantastic. Absolutely. So, we didn't even go there, but exercise is powerful for our microbiome. It is. And so actually I included in the book, but um, the uh, normal uh, uh, healthy exercise, again, not, not overdoing it to the extent that you deplete minerals or that, you, again, your, your nutrition becomes an issue, or, uh, is really, really effective. And it boosts the diversity of the microbiome. But it turns out if you stress exercise lab animals, if you make them run, when they don't want to, if you make them run more than they want to, that damages the microbiome. That's a stressor, not surprising. So, uh, a, so exercise to your good health is, is a win-win because it's helping the, part, the mammalian part of your body, it's helping your heart, but it's helping your microbes and their metabolism that support your body as well. Uh, stress, 
uh, be it uh, uh, being forced to do something you don't want to do uh, is not really good for your microbes. You just, uh, my wife and I, we've taught a course for years on uh, mindfulness and running, mindful mm -hmm. running. And we teach people how to run in a parasympathetic state rather than getting into a fight or flight response. When you're dancing, you are so happy that you are in the opposite of a fight or flight state and your body is just, this is kind of the, the Howard, Howard Martin heart math, you're in a state of coherence. Oh, that's, that's so important. Uh, I really appreciate you mentioning that. That absolutely is what I feel. But I also would mention that in this course I teach, uh, we teach students how to, how to extract themselves from drama. So you're talking about fight or flight, and it's very interesting because obviously you can do that with square breathing. You can do it with different meditative, uh, you know, with meditation as well. Get out of fight or flight. That's so important. But we actually teach an exercise where people um, – use a strategy they, they look at the information that they're taking in and how they handle that in a drama state mm -hmm. and then they remove themselves from that and compare how they handle inf information and what they do with it when they're out of drama and it's remarkable it's remarkable it's not that you don't want to experience drama or fight or flight you may want to but you need to actually be able to control that and that's where meditation is important we teach an exercise called the the alien observer where you're an interplanetary observer and you role play yourself into being very, very pragmatic and out of any emotion and out of any conclusions. And you start to see things that, that you miss, you miss in day to day life. And so those kind of things, being able to experience fight or flight, but, mm -hmm. but flip that switch and remove yourself from it when it's useful for you is critical. That, that's one of the life lessons I, I would wish that everyone could learn. I couldn't agree more. It, it really gives you a sense of when the emotions come up, realizing whether it's your microbiome or not, this is not necessarily me. And if I have a skewed filter right now, I better pay particular attention to what's really coming in versus what I think is coming in. That's absolutely right. Because, I mean, uh, keep in mind, plants, uh, plants are now known to communicate with each other through their fungi in the soil. And if you have plants that are attacked by aphids, others start to prepare against aphids because they get the message through the soil, essentially soil microbiome. So we have all of these connections and fight or flight can be in us or it can be something else that we're getting external. It can, you know, you, you're exactly right. You're asking the question, where is that? And what, where's that coming from? What is that? And, and that's part of the analysis of, okay, I, I want to figure Find, find where that fight or flight is, and then I can shift that and do something about it. Beautiful, beautiful. So from there, where can people go to find out more and to find your book? And for everyone out there, we really literally just scratched the surface on this book, The Human Superorganism. I, it, there is, prior to this, my record for number of questions, and we didn't even scratch the surface on the number of questions asked today, was 96. This was well over 100 questions that I prepped for this interview because there was topic after topic after topic I wanted to cover. So where, where do people go? Well, they can go to Amazon.com. Uh, they mm -hmm. can go to their uh, independent bookstore. They can go to uh, book chains uh, like Barnes & Noble. Um, so really any site that they would normally have for their books, any place they like to visit, they like to support. Uh, the book should be there or they should be able to get it, but probably it's already there. And uh, so I would encourage them to, to, uh, to check it out. We didn't get to talk about dogs and Cliff the dog, the microbiome sensing dog. So there's a lot in the book. There's animals in the book. And I think uh, thanks to my wife and the, the editors at Dutton Penguin Random House, it's generally been viewed as readable, which is good. And, um, and I, so I encourage them to go and use their favorite source for getting books. It should be there. What kind of dog do you have? We have two. We have a Bichon Frise, an, mm -hmm. uh, an old gal, and uh, we have a younger mix, lots of Opsil and Poodle, uh, miniature Poodle, lots of energy, uh, sort of a ninja dog. He can jump and just kind of settle down, soars through the air, and then just settle straight down. Uh, very, uh, very interesting. But they're both white and about the same size, so and they're great pals. And which one goes nuts for the doves in the morning? Oh, that's Toby. That's our mix. Yeah, he's the, he's the hunter. He has issues with the morning doves. We don't know why, but he's always on guard for the morning doves. He loves other birds, but not those. Gotcha. Well, last question I have before we dive into the meditation is any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? 
just that uh, when you start to think of yourself differently, when you start to think of yourself as having thousands of microbial species on your skin, in your gut, elsewhere, every place you're exposed to the environment, you might have your ego to go down a little bit, but you also might realize you're an even more awesome human than you ever dreamed. Woohoo! <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Rodney. This has been a lot of fun. It's really, it's got me thinking. Uh, even though I've done a lot, there's a lot more that I can do. And I think there's a lot more that each of us can do to protect, well, to use, what is it, Leeuwenhoek, the wee beasties that are us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the chance to be on this program, Michael. Well, thank you so much, Rodney. Do you have a short meditation you'd like to uh, uh, lead us in then? I would, yes, I would say if you want to see a problem or issue you have differently, mm -hmm. normally we're, our awareness is right here sort of between our eyeballs, just outside our head. We can together move that inside the head and we can step on an elevator there behind our eyes. We can put that on the elevator and we can ride it down into our chest area into what's a really large area. And it's like you have a spotlight here. and We can sink down even lower into that area. And if you're looking and observing something from here, from your chest, from that place, you can notice things differently. And that is one way to take an issue a problem I use to calibrate this in class, a Salvador Dali painting, mm -hmm. so that students look at it from a couple different awareness states. From here, you have a different way to view. And in some cases, you double your information. Who doesn't want to double their information if they're stuck on a problem? So that's the meditation. You can reverse it. You can bring it back, ride the elevator back up, step off, take the awareness right back where you started from, and it takes 30 seconds, and most of my colleagues would even say, if, if I've tried to focus harder and it doesn't work, I'd try that to, to get a different view, get a more useful view. And uh, I use that every day. It's great to double my information, have a better chance to see a way around or beyond my problems. So if you see, if you see a problem, you know it's right there in front of you. Take that problem, breathing, focus on the breath, yeah, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Deep breath, Buddha belly, open your chest. It's my West Coast swing position. Shoulders back, roll down. Yeah, yeah. Just like that. Deep breath and then do this. Actually, I didn't do that ahead of time. but I'd start there and then take that awareness down right into your chest area. And it's just a different way of looking. You can go through the grocery store and see where your attention goes when your awareness is here versus here. That would be a very interesting exercise to try. See what your hand goes toward on the shelf from a different way of viewing. I like that. Well, thank you so much, Rodney. It's been fantastic having you on the show. Everyone, go on out, get the human superorganism. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the human superorganism, and treat it well, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. I didn't dream we'd get into, have the chance to get into some of the wonderful contemplative stuff, but uh, I live it and love it. And it's, uh, it's my favorite thing to teach and to be involved with. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hi, Rodney. How are you?